Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode nine of Bleeding Blue Shirts. John Gino and Steve Valiquette as we preview game two, Rangers and Hurricanes. It comes Friday night uh, in Raleigh. Remember, eight o'clock puck drop, 7.30 for the pregame show. Steve and I will be there to set the table for what will be a pretty important game two for the Rangers. As we look to game two, I suppose you have to take into account what happened in game one and understand that, uh, you know, it might have been an opportunity lost and how the Rangers respond from that is going to be vital to what happens in game two. From a player's perspective, I've been there. I've been in seven game series since I was 15 years old. When you're in one of those games, John, you feel like when it's over, it's a missed opportunity, but furthermore, it's one that can haunt you. And, and you don't want that to come back. So much like game one versus the Penguins at home where Domingue comes in, you're kind of saying to yourself, well, isn't this similar in a lot of ways to how hard that one was to get over and can our group just get over it the same way? With this group, with this group specifically, I can see them getting over this because the young guys are playing so well and I just feel like they're naive enough not to read into it too much and see how big this stage is and just go into Carolina on Friday and just say, you know what? We had two great periods. We blew it in the third and in overtime. Now, I wanted to kind of pin it on a few players, and, and I wouldn't do that publicly, but at home, when I'm reviewing the scoring chances, sometimes I'm gonna say, okay, who are the problem players? What, what's, what's really hurting the team here? Is it concept, is it structure, or is it individual effort or detail? You wouldn't believe going over the scoring chances here that some of these plays, John, and I thought, I, I thought last night's game was a bit of an indictment on Zabanajad's line because they got out chance badly. But I'm looking at some of these chances and I'll give you an example. Uh, Nino Niederreiter has a breakaway in the third period that he hits the crossbar on. On the four check, Kreider does his job, he seals the wall. Mika comes for support, that's his role, he fills in. It just bounces over his stick, but in one touch, it's through Braun and Schneider who weren't terribly out of position, they were just coming up ice as they were supposed to support. But that's what Carolina does. They surprise you with one quick strike through the neutral zone and they're gone. And in, in most cases, they're getting it deep to get it back to work. But man, they can move fast. And I feel like all four lines can really fly for them if you let them. And they got on some kind of a tear in the third period. John, the Rangers gave up eight grade A chances between yeah. the third period, which was seven, and the beginning moments of overtime, they gave up one. But you give up seven, in a period, that's a game's worth, mm -hmm. all right? That's actually more than you want to give up in a game. That's really your cap. So in a period where Carolina has zero grade A's in period one, zero grade A's in period two, but they have seven in period three. It was a complete turnaround. I've never seen a wild swing like this in any of the Ranger games this year that we've covered. Yeah, and that's what Carolina can do. And they were very ordinary for the first two periods. That said, Crushing loss in game one against the Penguins, Rangers with a great response, a 5-2 win, albeit at home. Crushing overtime loss in game one on Wednesday. Uh, what are the parts of game one that the Rangers must bring to game two against what they have to know is going to be a much more hardworking and grinding Carolina team than what they saw? Yeah, they'll have to be ready. And I would assume if I'm on the Rangers team that I have to know these guys are coming the same way they came at us in period three and period one in game two. They're just gonna, they're just gonna be there. Uh, expect the first 10 minutes just to have to weather the storm. You know, I'm not telling you that I want the Rangers to play on their heels, but they have to be smart, they have to be precise, and they have to be moving their feet. Because when you're checking these Carolina Hurricanes, you check with your feet. You better be skating. Too many goals, uh, too many chances, but both of the goals, Rangers were coming back and they were water skiing. You know, you've got to, John, you've got to be moving your feet with these guys. I, I felt like there was a few of those spectator moments uh, where the Rangers just didn't keep moving. And uh, I think that their neutral zone is going to have to be as strong as it was in the first two periods, where what we saw in period three was a lot of high lobs, a lot of punts. Uh, coaches would say, live to fight another day. That's okay if there's support there. Yeah. There wasn't. And it was right back down your throat the other way. It was, 
it was a very difficult third and overtime period to watch as a as a guy that's analyzing the game. I mean, it was, I felt it myself. Yeah, yeah, you could live to fight another day, but you can't fight every single day because eventually you're going to lose one of those yep. fights. Uh, I think this is a very different team, the Carolina Hurricanes, if you go down two games in a series than Pittsburgh was. But that said, the great unknown about the Hurricanes is, are they as non-competitive on the road as they were in those three games in Boston in the first round? So I wouldn't necessarily declare game two a must win, but place a level of importance on getting that game on Friday night versus if they do find themselves back at the Garden down 0-2. Yeah, you know, I'm with you because, you know, worst case scenario, you go back home and you take care of business, you're right back to where you began and now you're looking to get a game five in Carolina. At the same time, uh, last night was a missed opportunity. I still feel like you should get some growth out of understanding that even if you're playing pretty steady game as the Rangers were in the first two periods, Carolina can really set back and play quietly too. Like they they had a lot of periods like that against the Bruins in the first round. They didn't blow through the Bruins, they didn't. Um, they had a lot of nonchalant, casual, getting through the game type of periods. I mean, come on, they approached periods one and two last night in Carolina like they were game 58 yeah. you know, and they were on the uh, six game winning streak. They were just chilling out and just kind of meandering through the game. Uh, that's where the Rangers just have to take advantage. And look, uh, you said it when we were sitting in the green room last night, if, if it was a one goal game at one point, I mean, did it ever feel that way? If the Rangers had just gotten one more goal, they probably would have put that game to sleep. Yeah, no, no question. So game two. Friday night, it's eight o'clock puck drop, 7.30 for the pregame show. Steve and I will bring it to you. And then we'll be there for a complete one hour post game show. We'll recap it all. You'll hear from the Rangers and the Hurricanes from down in Raleigh. So MSG is the place to be for all the pre and post game coverage for the game that will be on ESPN. Look forward to it, Stevie, as always, great thanks. All right, buddy, we'll see you there.